Today's show is sponsored by ThirdBridge. ThirdBridge is a widely used provider of expert interview transcripts whose clients include past guests on the show. Their content covers both public and private companies in any sector across all the major geographies around the world. To give you a sense, last year, over 16,000 investment professionals from 1,000 firms across private equity, public equity, and credit downloaded approximately 500,000 interview transcripts from Third Bridge Forum. Each of those transcripts covers a one-hour in-depth interview between an unbiased sector analyst and an industry executive. I've seen the platform and the coverage is incredible, ranging from mature mega caps to leading edge innovators like Stripe and SpaceX to thematic topics like crypto exchanges and alternative energy in China to just about everything in between. Third Bridge created this category of research and has by far the largest content platform available. If you're an asset manager or capital allocator looking to better understand your manager's positioning, visit thirdbridge.com slash capital for a try. Today's show is also brought to you by NASDAQ Asset Owner Solutions. NASDAQ Asset Owner Solutions is a technology-powered ecosystem that delivers transparency and decision support throughout the investment lifecycle by uniting eVestment, the industry's most comprehensive institutional data, with Solovis, which delivers true multi-asset class portfolio analytics. See why over a thousand asset owners and allocators around the world, from the world's largest sovereign wealth funds to single family offices and everything in between, rely on NASDAQ's comprehensive data, award-winning technology, and expert services for managing their portfolios. Visit nasdaq.com slash asset owner solutions for more information. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. My guest on today's show is Sarah Samuels, the Head of Investment Manager Research at NEPC, where she oversees teams across public equities, credit, hedge funds, and private markets for the $1.5 trillion investment advisory juggernaut. Prior to joining NEPC three years ago, Sarah worked at the senior level of both a top-notch endowment and a public pension fund. She sought to bring the best of both worlds to her role at NEPC. Our conversation covers Sarah's early career investing, time in the allocator seat at Mass Prim and Wellesley College, and decision to join NEPC. We discuss her key investment themes, investment framework blending qualitative and quantitative analysis, second level thinking, CIO mindset, alignment of interest, private equity allocations, and investment committees. We close discussing Sarah's work on DE&I and her involvement in Girls Who Invest. I hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, this week, it's time to reach out to your bitter rival. Now, this is a difficult ask, I'm sure. So I'd like to offer two ways to smooth the path. First, you might say, I listen to this podcast called Capital Allocators, and the host asks each guest about their biggest pet peeve. Well, you're mine, so there's that. Now, if that doesn't work, and it probably won't, you might want to try something like, I know we often don't see eye to eye, but you've always pushed me to be better, and I want to thank you by telling you about the Capital Allocators podcast. The host asks every guest about the biggest mistake they've ever made, and well, mine might have been competing against you, so there's that. Thanks so much for spreading the word. And while you're at it, hop on iTunes and leave a rating or write a review. Thanks for your support. Please enjoy my conversation with Sarah Samuels. Sarah, great to see you. Nice to see you, Ted. Why don't we go back to how you first got involved in investing? I came into the industry in a different way than most. I was just a scrappy kid. I didn't come from an elite or wealthy background. And I chose a school that gave me a great academic scholarship and support, the University of New Hampshire. Went to UNH, wanted to study abroad. And if I'm being honest, I really just wanted to go skiing in the Alps. So I majored in German and I lived in Salzburg, Austria. 
I lived abroad my senior year and came home and I needed to find a job. And I hadn't had internships or a traditional path or family connections or ins. I ended up being presented with two opportunities. One was as a fund accountant with a very well-known custodian bank here in Boston. And one was as an administrative assistant at Wellington Management Company. I asked a few friends who had some experience what they recommended. And I took the good advice to go to the best company possible. So I took the admin role at Wellington. It was the best decision I ever made. And I do mentor young people all the time now. And I give them the same advice all the time. Don't worry about titles. Go into the best company and you'll find amazing opportunities there. As an admin, I supported people and did calendar work and scheduling and stuff like that. But I was really curious and hungry. Right from the start, I fell in love with this industry. I love the math behind investing and how it links to macro. I love the constant creative thinking required to solve investment problems. And I love the scope and the purpose of what we were doing for retirees and college students in the community. My dad worked at Raytheon and we were managing the Raytheon pension fund. So that was really cool. And my mom was a retiree of the state of Massachusetts. She was a town planner and we were managing that investment pool as well. It was really tangible, rewarding work. I really wanted to be an analyst. So I began asking for analyst level projects. I took a couple courses at Harvard Extension School to learn more about financial statement analysis and accounting. And I worked hard to get promoted to analyst. After 18 months, I was able to move into an analyst role at Wellington. So between you and Jean, it seems like this is becoming an increasingly well-worn path. Where did your investment career go from that initial seat? I was there for six years. I was told pretty clearly you need to get your CFA and your MBA. And so I did. Got my CFA and then my MBA at night. I wasn't a portfolio manager, though, at Wellington, and I wanted to manage money. So I went to be an associate portfolio manager at Boston Advisors, which is a much smaller company. So I went from a big structured firm where everyone has a clearly defined role to a small firm where everyone wears a ton of hats and is just building things on the fly. So that was a great experience. But that's where I learned to trade. I learned how to build portfolios of stocks and bonds. I learned about quant models and how they work. It was a quant-oriented strategy. That's where I began to understand how stocks and bonds play roles in portfolios and building them. But I also learned during my time there that I'm a long-term investor. And the nature of that quant model and many quant models is to be shorter term in nature. That wasn't where I wanted to spend the rest of my time. So I joined Mass Prim, the state pension fund, in 2011 as an allocator. What was that decision at that time to shift to being on the allocator side? So Prim was a client of Wellington's and they were super well-respected. I remember any time we were getting ready for Prim to come into the office, they were like, oh, those people are really smart. And that's how I got exposed to the idea that you could be an allocator and a great investor. You didn't need to be a portfolio manager picking stocks and bonds. I applied for the position to work on the equity portfolio at Mass Prim and oversee the publicly traded equity portfolio, which was all externally managed and started there. So what did you learn in your time at Mass Prim? So Prim is unique, I believe. Some people might think that state pension funds are overly bureaucratic or risk averse, but Prim was just the opposite. We had a fantastic executive director and chief investment officer and Michael Trotsky. He's still there. He really encouraged us all to champion innovation. We were super lean. I was given a ton of responsibility for someone in their late 20s and early 30s overseeing tens of billions of dollars in assets and making big decisions and moving a lot of money around. And I like to say, if you can get something done at a public pension, you can get something done anywhere. So I learned a lot there about how to get things done. I learned how to invest in private markets during my time at Prim. We had actual real estate buildings across the country, including the one that we sat in and worked in here in Boston. We owned actual trees and we'd owned them forever in our timber portfolio across the country. We were anchor investors in buyout and growth equity funds. We were able to name terms and really be strategic partners. And we had a really cool hedging strategy where we did some pretty innovative stuff. I built asset allocation models there. I began to understand how to make decisions about where to put assets and evaluate valuations and put a lot of money to work in that time. It was great. That's where I learned how to present to investment committees and different stakeholders at different levels. What were the key lessons you learned and how to present to a committee? Generally, in my experience, committees tend to be pretty sophisticated. They're going to ask a lot of detailed questions. They made me much smarter because they made sure that I knew what I was talking about. So you have to prepare. The other thing that I learned is that boards, in many cases, at least for a public pension, tend to be composed more of maybe retired state policemen or people who are not in the industry. And so learning to present at a different level is actually much harder when you're trying to make something relatable to all the different types. 
I also learned that committee dynamics are very fluid and sometimes imperfect, and that's not anything to do with PRIM. It's all committees that we're all subject to bias, and it has inspired me to do quite a bit of investment bias work. But it's very difficult for humans to think in terms of pair trades. The temptation to look at line item risk is huge. Even if you know that a long treasury position is in there to offset the meaningful equity risk in the rest of the portfolio, you still might want to talk about that 80% of the time if it's underperforming. So what does a portfolio at Mass Prim look like? We had about two-thirds invested in public equities and fixed income. We were very large and we developed an active management versus index framework where we would put more active dollars to work in asset classes on the traded side that had a wider dispersion of results from the best and the worst managers and where the median manager outperformed net of fees. So that was linear, as you would imagine, mostly indexed in large cap U.S. equities. And then we were mostly active in emerging markets equity and the sliding scale in between. And then we had about a third of the portfolio in hedge funds and private markets. Our hedge fund portfolio began a long time ago as fund of funds. We realized we had 240 underlying relationships when we looked through those dozen or so fund of funds, and we built a direct program when I was there. And then we had private equity, real estate, timber, private debt. What are some of the subtleties that go into being a public institution? I would say that Prim had a great governance structure relative to some others. When you have an institution that has a sole fiduciary, that can be tricky from a governance perspective. The sole fiduciary is generally the state treasurer. In this instance, we had a pretty diversified board, and the treasurer was but one vote. She was the chairperson of the committee and the board, and she represented different stakeholders. Being able to understand committee dynamics, meaning how are people leaning, what are their areas of focus and interest, and how can we make progress in what we're doing in a way that we can feel good about our fiduciary obligation to get the best return possible, and maybe we can invest in diverse managers, or maybe we can think about the environment in different ways. So talk about your next step. You go from the big public institution to the smaller college endowment. I had a really great time at Mass Prim. My career grew very quickly there. I ended my last couple of years there as deputy chief investment officer, and I loved it. But I got an opportunity to join Wellesley College as a managing director. It was amazing. It was an elite endowment, fantastic portfolio. I went from a $70 billion pool of assets to a $2 billion pool. The return targets were pretty much the same for the public pension and the endowment, about 7% nominal, but the investment approaches were really, really different. We were very data-driven at MassPrim. We had all those separately managed, publicly traded accounts, and we could measure things with a good deal of granularity. And then at Wellesley, the asset allocation was flipped on its head, two-thirds in less liquid, either private markets or hedge fund strategies, and the rest a third or so in tradable. So we focused a lot more of our process at Wellesley on the qualitative and the critical thinking and relationships with GPs and other LPs and sourcing great new ideas. We were generalists at Wellesley, which I think is a really good model. It works really well with smaller investment offices. And I learned a lot about how to think like a CIO and allocate capital across the liquidity spectrum and have perspectives on everything, whereas many larger teams are siloed. A huge part of our program at Wellesley was in privates. I traveled across the world going to visit with GPs who are super limited access and high quality. So I learned a lot about how to manage a large portfolio of liquids, how to do commitment pacing plans and manage that illiquidity, how to work with different constituents. So like the public pension, you're going to have different constituents, whether it's students or teachers who all have views on how the endowment should be managed. That served me quite well, especially in my time here at NEPC, as well as in the investment committee that I oversee at UNH. When you have these two quite different experiences, what did you take away as what resonated most for you across the two? When I came to NEPC, I basically brought over what I believe to be the strongest parts of both of those very different approaches and married them together into our current approach at NEPC. So I believe it's especially strong. At Prim, like I said, we were really data-driven. So we used quantitative tools regularly. We could look at all kinds of performance vectors. We could measure and make decisions based on valuations, and we traded on that. We needed to be able to support that for FOIA reasons as well as others. Then going to Wellesley, we didn't have that data. And even if we did, what are you going to do with it? Like, so what? Even if you knew your exposure to Chinese venture to the 10th point, you can't really trade on it because it's a liquid unless you do a secondary sale. So we thought much more about succession planning at the GP, which we viewed as a really big risk in many portfolios. We talked a lot about alignment of incentives and making sure that when our managers were making money, we were also making money. And we talked a lot about business strategy and product proliferation and what the manager's edge is. So it was super qualitative. 
That was hard for me to get used to because I am kind of a data geek. It was so good to flex that muscle though and to be able to think creatively. So a lot of these pools, particularly the smaller ones, have that choice. They can either invest with these perceived elite managers and have a little bit less transparency, or they could invest in smaller managers or do something where you have more. Which would you say is better? There are tremendous returns to be had in the private markets when you can get access to those top managers. That is the key for these elite schools. They have some fantastic relationships. And I describe venture capital investing and probably growth equity as well as the halo effect is super strong. So the good GPs attract the good LPs, and this all also attracts the greatest portfolio companies. It's super important to get into those best top names regardless. And when you think about the return potential for some of those earlier stage private investments, it dwarfs the fee impact and it's well worth it. A lot of people aspire to be sitting in one of these endowment roles for their career. What was it that caused you to leave it and join NEPC? A couple of things. One is that there was a tremendous amount of travel and we were going all over the place into China and I had a very young family, little babies. It's a tough fit for me at that stage of life. The other is that I really like to build things and solve problems. And that portfolio was just awesome. And there wasn't much to fix. There wasn't a lot to build. It was really a well-oiled machine. I had been a client of NEPCs for six years during my time at Prim and stayed close with the folks here. And they asked me to consider joining the firm as a partner. They asked me to take a fresh perspective to our investment approach. I was just excited about that. I was excited about the idea of approaching something, leading some change and building something engaging lots of people. I like a challenge. Why don't you give me a sense today of the scope of NEPC? NEPC is a private partnership, which is a really important thing. It was really important to me because we're able to align ourselves with our clients, make decisions for ourselves without a parent company involved. We can be nimble. We can do all these great things as an organization. And we have over one and a half trillion in assets under advisement and under management. We have about 400 clients across seven different client groups. That includes high net worth or family office. It includes endowments and foundations, healthcare institutions, insurance, public and corporate pension funds, and Taft-Hartley. So we're solving for lots of different goals with these clients through both advisory and outsourced CIO or discretionary engagements. We have about a 70-person investment team under Tim's leadership. Coming in as head of manager research, how many managers are there across that platform of a trillion and a half dollars? We rate our managers, we call them our focus placement list managers, our highest conviction. Those are the ones we spend our most time on and try to get into our clients' portfolios. And we have about 1,200. So that's across equity, credit, multi-asset, hedge funds, private equity, private debt, and real assets. So with that kind of scope, looking at the last year, how much money will you put to work in any given year? The investment cadence and the cycle of putting money to work is different for public markets versus privates. So in private markets, we expect to put about $5 billion to work in our highest conviction strategies. Now, our clients have a ton of underlying exposures to some of their own investments that we help them with, but are maybe not our highest conviction names. So $5 billion there. And then on the public market side, many of our clients do what we call searches. They'll say, we need to revamp our lineup. And that represents about $26 billion. I'm curious what you see in terms of themes, because I'm sure what you're encompassing is probably a microcosm of the industry. So I'd love to hear what your clients are interested in. I would answer that with four major themes. One is really rethinking hedge funds and the role that they play in portfolios. And what that has meant is a decline in target hedge fund allocations and those that remain having a really finely tuned objective for those. We really work with our clients to make sure that the hedge funds that they have are solving a problem that can't be solved using public markets or private markets. You really need to make sure that it's a special exposure that you can't get elsewhere. And we also look at things like the percentage of fees that are going to the house versus going to our clients on the alpha capture that our clients are getting. So we have a number of tools and metrics that we use. We try to understand exactly what the exposures are so that we can be sure we're not just paying hedge fund fees and locking up our capital for betas that we could get elsewhere. The other theme is an increase in private markets almost across the board. So clients are backing up the truck. We expect to put double the amount of capital to work in private markets in the next two years. So looking at more like $8 billion. And that's simple. Low rates mean that they have to go out on the risk spectrum. We can talk about this and my thoughts about (laughs) what it means for private market return potential going forward. The other two are ESG, so sustainability, 
environmental, social, and governance is really starting to be something that clients are reflecting in their portfolios. And it's not just ESG, it's mission-based investing. So it's making your portfolio look like the mission that you're working to solve and bring to your constituents, whether that's faith-based or something else. And then the last is DEI. Hugely important to clients, increasingly important. I, for one, am thrilled. I do a lot of work with young people who are minorities or young women. I'm involved with girls who invest, had interns, I mentor them, founded the Boston chapter of PE Win. We need more diversity in this industry. And, you know, tying it back to my background, I was sort of a diverse candidate by other metrics. I didn't have the traditional pedigree. I didn't have traditional training. The punchline is that I do believe that hard work and tenacity pays off and you can do anything in this industry. You don't need to have the connections and you don't need to look or behave in a certain way or have a certain background. Great. I'd love to turn to the research process. So you step in, you like fixing things. You step into a lot. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of manager relationships. I'm curious what you saw when you came in. So I came in to oversee our marketable securities team, our publicly traded equity and bond managers. And that was a 15-person team. Five months later, they asked me to take over hedge funds as well, and then private markets a year later. So now it's everything. It's about 45 people. But I started on the long-only side, and I came in knowing that I'd be taking a fresh look at our investment process. And I was pleased to find a strong track record and a strong process, but I did see opportunity to formalize it and to augment it, as I discussed with some of those best parts of the endowment and the public pension fund processes. I began to lead a change management approach pretty quickly. I came in and listened for three months. That's all I did is I listened. You can't really come in from the outside and come in too hot or demand that lots of things change. It has to be done with tact and care. I use the change management cycle framework as the backdrop for all of this. And it's actually super simple, similar to a grief cycle, six phases. The first is loss. So people don't want to change the way they do things usually because we're humans. And then doubt in the new process and their new leader and then discomfort. And I watched all this happen. It's like a cycle. After discomfort, it's this danger zone. You're either going to win people over or you're going to lose them. And that happened. And then discovery, understanding, and integration. So it was a fabulous framework to have to guide this. And I learned a lot. And we successfully integrated this new framework across all of our strategies. Essentially, it's a long and detailed approach to doing consistent and deep diligence of investment managers using a CIO mindset and second level thinking. Those are my themes. Why don't you take me through the high level of the categories that you use when you're assessing managers according to this framework? Sure thing. You probably wouldn't be super surprised by some of them. We've got the firm and the organization. We've got people and resources. We've got investment philosophy, strategy, and process, and we have performance. And then we have subcategories under that. So within business and without firm and organization, we want to know about the ownership structure and the culture and the business strategy and whether they can continue to be a going concern and make their money based on fees or if they're going to potentially go out of business. The interesting thing to take away, there are a couple of highlights of why this framework works and why it's really important for us to use it. One is that performance is actually a pretty low weight in the model. We all know that past performance is not indicative of future results. We've all seen that disclosure in the pitch books that we read. And yet research time and time again shows that this is how investors make decisions. It's a behavioral bias. It's extremely elegant and defensible and safe, but it's first level thinking and it will not lead to outperformance, making decisions based on past performance. So there has to be more to it. Performance matters, but it's also a super fluid thing. You need to use additional tools, and we have some additional quantitative tools that augment the usual performance metrics. And then the other is an analyst opinion score. My team, these are sophisticated investors with many years of experience, and I want them to be able to use their intuition, use their spidey sense to make sure that the art of investing doesn't go away by using this very structured framework. And then the final thing is the investment edge. We want managers to be able to articulate to us, what is your investment edge and why is it sustainable? And you would be shocked how few managers are able to actually answer what their investment edge is. When you break this framework down into these long lists of questions that fall into those categories, how does your team actually use that to aggregate to helping make decisions? Warren Buffett is quoted as saying that once you have ordinary intelligence, an IQ of 100 or so, you can be a great investor. The thing that prevents people from being great investors is their emotions and falling victim to the greed cycle. We know that emotional decision making is not good for investing. I call it a hot state, making a decision from your emotional brain or your caveman brain. 
it exists to save you from the saber-toothed tiger coming at you. Our brains are wired in a certain way to respond to perceived threats. But in many instances, we're actually not threatened. And using that emotional brain to make investment decisions leads to terrible outcomes. We see it all the time when people show their personal traded portfolios where they get scared and sell at the bottom and then they buy at the top. There are a lot of ways to overcome this hot state thinking and to make decisions from a cold state. And one is to use an investment checklist. We call ours the investment framework. So many benefits. One is that it's created in a cold state. So you create this list of criteria that you believe contains signal, not noise, and you're setting it when you're not emotional. That's one benefit. The other is it gives a lot of transparency in our team decision-making process. And when our team gets together and we're bringing an idea through, we all see this investment model and we're all looking at the same criteria and are able to challenge one another and we know exactly what went into each of those sections. So we're speaking the same language. It creates a lot of rigor just by doing the same process. There is research that shows that surgeons, when they use the 19-point surgical checklist, actually reduce the number of deaths in the operating room by 50%, 5-0. It was not a complicated checklist. It just forced them to go through the steps. It memorializes our decisions, so we have an audit trail, and it's great at training new team members and ensuring consistency. And do you find that each manager you review is subject to answers on your team of every single one of these questions before you're ready to make a decision? We don't ask the managers to answer every one of these questions. These 265 questions, data points that we calculate are guideposts for our diligence. Another reason that the framework makes a lot of sense is that our marketing colleagues on the asset manager side, on the GP side, they know what they're doing. They are really good at telling us what we want to hear. When I'm teaching the team how to invest, my position is that we should really be guiding this discussion and making sure that everything we want to have answered is answered. And another tool that we use is to ask why three times. So if they tell you a story about a stock, you dig a layer deeper and say, well, why is that? Then you can really get to the meat of what is actually happening and go beyond that prepared marketing response. So we're going to take a quick break from the conversation to tell you about Visible Alpha. Visible Alpha built a platform in partnership with 160 brokers to analyze consensus data and financial metrics on over 6,000 publicly traded companies globally. Visible Alpha extracts data from every line item across sell-side models so you can better understand expectations on metrics beyond just revenue and earnings without having to dig through models one by one. Try Visible Alpha for free by visiting visiblealpha.com slash TED. And now, back to the show. What are some of the more sophisticated quantitative tools that you saw used at MassPrem that you've integrated in NEPC? There are really three ways that we look at this. When we're looking at marketable return patterns and track records, we want to understand if the manager's excess return in alpha was attributable to luck or skill. We have some proprietary ways of measuring whether it's within the realm of possibility that a manager's track record was just luck. The other is, will he be successful going forward? This is a helpful heuristic. We're looking at three things. The relationship of the risk a manager's taking, so the tracking error, to the fees, to the excess return that they say they can get. It's essentially a break-even IR. That's what we call it. What is the IR needed to make back their fees? What's the IRO needed to make back their fees and generate the excess return they say they can? And if they need an IR of two to be successful, I don't think they're going to be very successful. So we're able to have that discussion. Something's amiss, whether the fees are too high or they're not taking enough risk or their alpha expectations are too high. So we have a lot of good discussions there. And then the last is essentially factor attribution, but it's our own way of doing it. And we take the return stream of a manager and we regress it against a number of other benchmark returns that we know are present in that portfolio. And at the end of the exercise, we understand where the portfolio's significant tilts are and how much that contributed to returns. The residual, the leftover, is a proxy for true skill. That's been a fascinating and really important tool in our toolkit. I'm curious how often you find that the results of those quantitative analyses are meaningfully different than what your intuition tells you if you're the person monitoring a manager. The larger firms generally know what their exposures are because they have risk management teams who are looking at these things. The smaller firms are much more gut-driven in general in terms of managing risk. 
and they are sometimes surprised. So one time we worked with a hedge fund strategy that had a huge factor loading to two-year treasuries, and we were all surprised by it. They did some digging, and then they understood it was really their collateral. Now, on the private market side, we have a similar approach. It's not factor attribution. It's just we can unpack a bio manager's return pattern to look at how did they generate returns? Did they generate it through earnings growth or multiple expansion or use of leverage? We're happy to pay two and 20 for the first two, not so much for use of leverage. But it's interesting because some GPs think about the world that way, but many just say, well, it's all alpha. So it's been really helpful to drill down and understand how they're creating value. You alluded to what you called second level thinking, and I'm curious what you meant by that. Second level thinking is thinking about convoluted and interacting variables. First level thinking would be saying something like, this strategy outperformed by 400 basis points. Therefore, they must be good. Therefore, I should buy them. It's probably not going to lead to outperformance, but it's super easy. It's definitely more simple. It's linear thinking, and we want to get away from that because we need to be a step ahead of the market. Second level thinking would say, yes, but what about these exposures that the manager has? And what about this that's changed? And they had a non-benchmark exposure here. That's really what we're talking about with second level thinking. And there are a number of ways that we look to ensure that we don't fall victim to first level thinking. There's a great Howard Marks piece from several years ago that talks about second level thinking. But you have to be comfortable being a little weird, a little out there, a little different and bold when you're doing this second level thinking type of work, because you're probably going to be contrarian. And how about the CIO mindset, something that you were trained on? How do you bring that into a larger organization? Several years ago, I was speaking with the CIO of an endowment here in town, and the CIO had stepped into the role from the outside. And the senior investment staff, they were all specialists. So we had a venture capital investor who spent all their time doing that, someone doing buyouts, another person doing real estate, and on and on. And the CIO quickly found that when she had a question about the overall portfolio, the junior support analyst was actually one of the most valuable team members. He was the only one seeing the entire portfolio. He was doing reporting on it. He was monitoring overall performance, moving the cash levels and rebalancing and understood why things went into the portfolio. He was the MVP and he's able to answer any question that the CIO had as to why an investment was in the portfolio and how it all fit together. This is the expectation I have for every single person on my team. And there are 45 people on the manager research team at NEPC to think like a CIO. And that means evaluating, are we getting paid to lock up our capital? So that can be any number of exercises that we use, but we really need to be sure that we're getting paid. We're looking across the entire liquidity spectrum and we're deliberate about where we're putting our clients' capital. So an example might be hedge fund strategy and a long only strategy or a hedge fund strategy and a private credit strategy could be investing in the exact same issuer in high yield, but with very different approaches. And we need to be aware and deliberate when we're getting that exposure. So we do that through using the investment framework creates a common language for us all to talk about things. We also have a number of tools that help us understand on an apples to apples basis, what are we talking about with public and private markets? And I think that's a big issue with teams, especially when they're specialists in long only versus specialists in privates is creating a common language. You've got multiple uninvested capital and IRR versus time weighted return. You've got all sorts of different ways of approaching things. If we can break that down, which takes a lot of work, we're able to have much more robust discussions. Another big feature of what you saw at Wellesley and the endowments is this idea of alignment of interest. With something like 1,200 managers, you must see a wide range of what you would consider properly aligned. So what is it that you care about and how do you instill it in the managers you're backing? Depends on the asset class, but when we're talking about private markets, we want to ensure that the terms are fair. So that's the first thing. We want to make sure that, like I said, if the GPs are getting paid or our clients are getting paid. We want to look at succession risk and key person provisions. Are we set up for success if the founder and star portfolio manager or star investor at a GP is approaching retirement age, hasn't identified or groomed the next generation of talent, and has had a period of underperformance? What's going to happen? They're probably going to sell to another entity and fundamentally change the investment and our capital is locked up. In many cases, what we see is that the founding partners have not thought about that people think they're invincible. Really, you need to start grooming that next generation at least five years before it's time. And engage with outside counsel is what we advise GPs. Begin thinking about the planning of who's going to buy out your stake in the management company. In many cases, the next generation can't necessarily afford to do so. That's a big one. 
in the public markets, alignment has a lot to do with the percentage of the fee going to the house. In hedge funds, it's whether the liquidity of the underlying matches the liquidity of the fund. I'm curious how you think about conviction. Having gone from a much smaller portfolio, a smaller number of managers, to now effectively backing a much larger number. We have a rating system of one through five, the primary way that we articulate our conviction. One rated strategies are our best ideas and a five rated strategy would be something that we're not recommending we put in client portfolios. So the rating scheme helps us out there to reflect our conviction. And then I think it's understanding what it is that clients are looking for. So you've got your family office or endowment foundation client, they're looking for the highest octane stuff they can get when it comes to an equity portfolio, whereas a defined contribution plan is looking to minimize litigation risk and outperform the benchmark by a little bit, but not underperform by a lot. We are able to articulate in our ratings and in our recommendations why a strategy makes sense for different client types. So when you think about alignment within NEPC, what gets rewarded for people on your team? We have a vision and mission statement that I set for my team. We're not like the asset management institutions that are going to measure our researchers on their outperformance of names that they pick, because it's a long-term measurement cycle, especially with private markets. So when I'm working with the team, it's much more about culture and are we reflecting on our decisions on a regular basis and is the content of our work coming to fruition? So we have a vision statement, we have a mission statement, and we have five pillars that guide us. One is that CIO mindset. I'm looking for whether people are interacting and learning and talking to each other. I'm looking for a team culture. Super important. Our reputation is really important. And then accountability and efficiency. And we do measure our performance on a regular basis, but it can lead to some really scary and suboptimal decisions to trade in and out of managers if you're too short term. So you spent a lot of time, as you said, on the road traveling to visit managers in your time at Wellesley. And now we're coming out of this COVID period, that idea, that value of culture, how all that travel or work from home fit into what's evolved. We were as surprised as anyone that our COVID era enhancements for remote due diligence were actually quite good. So we added a number of things to our virtual diligence that made our work almost as good as if we were able to be in person. So we were able to get virtual tours of the office. We were able to use technologies to look at SEC examination letters in a safe way remotely. When it comes to the future of diligence, I do think we can do a lot more virtually, but we still need to be traveling and meeting with managers. You miss a lot of stuff when you're not there face-to-face, whether it's the dynamics of the junior person with the senior person, or we went to one manager we loved, but they had everything in boxes in terms of their storage system. That's a little concerning. Let's dig a little deeper into that. We would have known that if we didn't go to the office. When it comes to managing teams generally, I could share a lot of thoughts on that and what COVID has done to morale, to motivations, different personality types, and how they all behave differently and generational themes. So how have you gone about managing your team? I learned how to manage people in my early 30s when I was at Mass Prim, and I was put in charge of two men, one in his mid-40s, one in his mid-50s, and then a guy in his mid-20s. So we kind of had each generation. I was curious to learn more about how to manage people because they were all so different in terms of how they wanted to be managed and work with me. So I got a coach, Sloan Klein. She's a wonderful executive coach. I've been working with her since 2016. Did some research and the generations can be quite different and generalized in different ways. So you've got the baby boomers. Their boss says jump and they basically say how high. They like to perform well. They like to do what's asked of them. The Generation X team members were the latchkey kids. Both their parents worked. They came home after school and they were super independent. They were on their own and they hate to be micromanaged. They do not want you involved. They want to do what they know how to do. Millennials were raised as mini consultants to their parents. Parents would say, where do you want to go on vacation this year? What should we have for dinner tonight? And they want to be part of every decision. They want to be involved. That's the generational theme. When it comes to COVID, I would say that The remote work environment has benefits and drawbacks for introverts and extroverts. That's the big way that I would describe this. Extroverts were really miserable being at home. They were really engaged in Zoom meetings, whereas introverts loved being at home. It was really hard to pull them out of their shell and to engage them. So I instituted coffee chats where each month we paired somebody with another person to have virtual coffee. And we have a number of efforts like that. So I'd love to turn to some views on the markets. You mentioned that on the margin, lots and lots of your clients are moving or still moving into private markets. I'm curious what you think about all that movement of capital. 
I do think that we're going to see a reckoning. The scale of dry powder is huge. The amount of capital in private markets, it's almost $10 trillion in private markets AUM. And $2 trillion of that is held by VC firms, which is astonishing when you think about those numbers for early stage investments. So I do think we're going to see valuations fall. We need to watch out for deal quality and buyout debt, which is tied to floating rates many times. We're seeing layoffs happen at venture-backed portfolio companies. Wage inflation is just killing them. We're going to have more clarity in the next couple of years on the winning and losing GPs that are out there. And manager selection is going to be more important than ever. But in this low rate environment, it all makes sense. Risk that's being financed that maybe shouldn't have been. So companies that maybe are not the highest quality that wouldn't have gotten the financing and the backing if there wasn't so much capital sloshing around. So we need a pullback. It's not going to be pretty and it's going to take some time to work through valuations. In the shorter term, we're also seeing a lot of clients struggle with and grapple with what to do given the denominator effect and the swiftness of the raises and the sizes of the funds that are coming back to market. So what do you do from a commitment pacing plan point of view? How do you reconcile those two things? A couple of things. One is remember that you're giving away a call option to the GP. We don't know when the GP is going to call this capital and invest it and put it to work. Some of the best vintage year returns are in years like this, leading up to and during a market correction or a recession. What we advise clients to do is look at your pacing plan. Pacing plans are really important. Don't try to time vintage year allocations to private markets. You can't do it, especially with some clients who maybe are dipping their toes in the water to private markets and don't have this experience and haven't gone through enough cycles to understand how it works. They might want to try to skip a couple of years, and that's not a great idea. This can be a really good entry point. If your budget is eaten up really quickly, more quickly than forecasted, which we are seeing this year because of the swiftness of the raises coming back to market and the bigger funds, we're advising clients to continue to commit, but maybe cut your check size a little bit, especially to your highest conviction GPs, because as you know, you're going to lose that access if you step away from a fund. And then setting up liquidity guardrails is the next thing that's really important. So understanding when you're going to get out over your skis through regular reporting and measurement of percentage of capital committed over the last three years as a percentage of NAV, for example, percentage of uncalled capital as a percentage of spending, things like that. There are a bunch of metrics that really help investment committees and investment staffs understand if they're going to get out over their skis. We're definitely seeing the actual allocations jump up pretty meaningfully because the public markets are coming down. What are some views that you have that you're trying to get some of your leading edge clients to adopt that aren't as common across, say, your whole client base? We think that healthcare is for sure a theme in healthcare in China. China is a little scary for a lot of people right now. It was a big part of a lot of portfolios. And I would say it's a little scary for investment committees to think about committing new capital to China right now. But we think there are tremendous returns to be had. Just got to watch out with Chinese managers. Is the DPI there? Are they actually distributing that capital or is it just in the marks? There's a lot of interesting next generation alternatives out there. When you think about the David Swenson model, people think it's this recipe that you can replicate by just throwing ingredients into a bucket and throwing them into an asset allocation model and you're going to get the same results. And the reality is you have to be quite careful and unique and different, which is what Swenson was doing 30 years ago. You've taken everything you've learned across these steps to your seats as chair of investment committees. You mentioned UNH. What do you do on those committees to impart everything you've learned? One of the committees had about 12 voting members when I joined and pretty sparse attendance and the different people would attend each meeting. So the first thing we did was shore up the committee. Ideal committees should be five to seven people. It increases accountability. It increases the preparation. The discussion is different in the room. Then clearly articulating roles and responsibilities. It doesn't sound that interesting. It sounds mundane. It is super important. This one committee I was involved with wanted to interview every manager that would be hired for the endowment and interview any manager that would be fired. Imagine the schedules and the coordination and poor decision making that could potentially result from something like that. They were also quite interested in making tactical decisions. When I came in as the chair, I did a survey. I had about 20 questions and I wanted each committee member to answer them blindly. Nobody knew what other people answered. They submitted the survey. It was things like how much a liquidity risk can we take? What's a drawdown we can withstand? Why are we here? What's the return we're looking to get? Where we had dispersion of results, we really honed in and spent time trying to understand why we had different expectations. What we ended up deciding on is that our highest and best use, and I think this is the right way, is to focus on strategic stuff as a committee. So asset allocation, 
risk management, investment policy statement, and spending, and to really de-emphasize that tactical trading and the manager interviews. Another best practice is conducting a pre-mortem or a crisis plan. So what are you going to do when things get really hard? To try to have a circuit breaker around that emotional caveman brain. Trying to get the institution to only look at the longer term returns in the performance report, it's really tempting to look at three months and zero in on that, but making sure the time measurement period aligns with what the institution has. And then being a strong committee chair means a lot of things. You probably should do very little speaking and try to get people to engage. And it's also managing grandstanding behavior. There's a funny dynamic that happens with volunteer committees and boards where people feel as though they need to contribute, so they go on about something they know about. We were building up our private market portfolio, as I mentioned. So there was education, understanding how much can you put to work in a given year. We went from 10 to 20% in terms of target, 10% in privates to 20%. And they want to do it overnight. You can't. You can't increase it more than one and a half to 2% a year. The roles and responsibilities comes down to what are you here for and how do we tie that to the programmatic needs? What are your next initiatives on the research team at NEPC? DEI is really important to me personally. I have two little girls, Holland and London. They're eight and five. I have my own diverse career path. So we're really interested in improving diversity in our industry, whether it's through working with girls who invest, through underwriting and putting money with diverse managers across all stages. We're working hard on ESG and being able to reflect missions. Right now, we're actually integrating that investment framework into the private markets. So it's going to rhyme at the high level. But there are going to be very specific things that are applicable for each of the private market segments. That's been a really fun thing to engage people on. And then I think it's just team building. It's a really weird labor market, and we're doing everything we can to keep our highest quality people. As you dive in on the de and I'm curious where you see low-hanging fruit in the industry and where you see unexpected challenges. The low-hanging fruit is there are awesome managers out there that are diverse-led or diverse-owned. So diverse led is like a third of the ownership is diverse. Diverse one is 50% or more. We have an annual event where we invite diverse managers to come and meet with our researchers. And it benefits them because we're able to tell them what we're seeing in their strategy or their firm and how they've set it up and maybe how it could be optimized or done better. And it's opening up our aperture so that we're able to see these awesome strategies. And last year, we underwrote 17 diverse owned strategies that are in client portfolios now. That was low-hanging fruit. That was simple and easy, and we've got to give them an at-bat, kind of like the Rooney rule. Challenges, I think a lot of times these types of things are deeply rooted traditions, whether it's being for or against something. And what I mean by that is many times for public pensions, for example, an initiative like that needs to be legislatively mandated. So to have a certain threshold to invest in DEI strategies needs to be legislatively mandated. And if that hasn't come from the top or if it doesn't come from the students at a university, it might not be a huge area of focus. When it comes to more diversity in terms of women running money, we got some work to do there. And I think Girls Who Invest is making a really big dent, but it's a big ask to overcome some of the old networks and some of the older beliefs out there. Why don't you touch on what Girls Who Invest is doing today? Absolutely. So Seema Hingarani is the visionary behind it. And in 2015, I saw her speak about it. It was the kernel of an idea, and I chased her down after she spoke. I said, how do I get involved? It was 30 students that first year. The design is to pull women out of career tracks that maybe they weren't aware of investing or don't have the ins or the connections, so non-traditional candidates, to bring them into a program where they get taught at Penn or other institutions for a month, and then they have actual internships with private markets or long-only firms actually touching the money, moving capital, investing. We have hundreds of students now each year, and the idea is to have 30% of the world's capital managed by women by 2030. So it's a fantastic program. Those internships are invaluable. And if anybody would like to know more about how to work with the Girls Who Invest intern, love to hear from you. Well, Sarah, I want to ask you a couple of closing questions before I let you go. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I kind of gave that away in the intro. It's skiing. A couple of years ago, I just went to Switzerland and went heli skiing and then COVID struck. So I'll be going back soon. What's your biggest personal pet peeve? When people crunch on ice. <laughs> but I read somewhere it's a sign of genius if crunching bothers you. So I was comforted by that. <laughs> How about on the investment side, your biggest investment pet peeve? Ego. Ego gets in the way of all good things. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Sloane Klein. She is a wonderful and recognized executive coach who I've been with for six years. And Mike Evan. He is a good friend now. He was a committee member who taught me a lot during my time at Prim. 
What's the biggest mistake you've made and what did you learn from it? On the managing of people side and coming in really hot and micromanaging as a new manager and not knowing how to delegate, that makes your life pretty difficult. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Living within my means and a sense of a right-sizing of where I stand in the world and no entitlement. Sarah, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I wish I knew this much earlier, but the advice that I got from someone once is just have 30 seconds of bravery. If it's asking for a promotion, if it's interviewing for a job, doing something bold, speaking up in a meeting, just be brave for 30 seconds. Even if it makes you sweat, even if you feel like you're going to throw up, do it. You will reap the benefits. It's fantastic. Sarah, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, Ted. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.